So, I, of course, my topic is Bozhenka, and I am veering off the topic a little bit. Uh, my, you know, there are so many endless experiences, and so my experience, for instance, in my town, which happened to be close to Kshanov, uh, the young people who were caught in 1942 to be sent into <coughs> slave labor camps. And then we come of a huge family. My mother had 11 siblings, and this is really off the topic. The boss may say, get out of here. That's not what we, you came to speak about. Okay. So in 42, they caught the young people to send them to slave labor camps. And a number of my cousins went to slave labor camps. And they went with valises of clothes. A year later, they declared the town, actually not a year later, a few months later, they declared the town Judenrein, cleansed of Jews. They, at that time, they deported my parents and my brother, and I was there as well and ran away to Auschwitz, and they were murdered. But the cousins, who were not caught to go to slave labor camps, ended up going to Auschwitz. All the cousins who went to slave labor camps survived. All the cousins who ended up in Auschwitz did not survive. Now, at that point in 42, four of us sisters managed to run away to the next town where they still had Jews. And we survived there for another year and then went to Auschwitz. Now, because we came to Auschwitz from another town, not from home, we did not have any friends or acquaintances or neighbors. So we never had any peer support groups. <coughs> okay. So the reason I'm mentioning is because there were so many endless variables that determined. So when I came to Auschwitz, just to give you another example, with my older sister, who was 20 at the time, and I was 12, my aunt was the equivalent of one street block away, and we were beyond walking that one block to see my aunt, neither my aunt nor my sister and I ever saw my aunt who lived one block away. So the difference between a slave labor camp and an extermination camp, there was a huge difference. It also depends when you got to Auschwitz, which year. The earlier you came, the harder it was. Okay, going back to my topic. Right now, I am battling. I was in bed for a few days. And I'm totally woozy and dazed and whatever. And I am, my topic is Bozhenka. And I am blaming it all. And of course, when I was bedridden, I was no way going to prepare for my speech. And being a last minute person, totally unprepared and woozy, and I don't know if I can form more than one sentence clearly. Okay. And I blame it all on Bozhenka. Bozhenka 
Claire Shalom passed away in December at age 96. And I am sure she is filming up there. What do you mean you're going to talk about my heroism? What did I do? I didn't do anything. I am sure she's responsible for my being in bed and not preparing. <laughs> she doesn't want me to talk about her heroism. She didn't do anything. Bozhenka always, in her last cover, in all her conversations with me when she was in America, she always ended, Bronichka Moya, an endearing name. My Bronichka, take care of yourself. <coughs> I can see her telling me, come on, shut up. I mean, she didn't use shut up. You know, I am using those words, but she did not. Go home and take care of yourself. And stop talking about my heroism. Okay. So, who was Bozhenka? And I do have a picture, a very poor picture of Bozhenka. She was a beautiful young lady. When she was in, okay. She looks very dour here, and I sort of have always mixed feeling of showing it because it doesn't really represent her. So Bozhenka came from a village in Slovakia. And at age 20, when she was a nurse, at age actually 22, she, in 1942, she was caught while working in a hospital in Bratislava. Uh, I understand that Tiso, who was a priest uh, and became head of Slovakia, I understand that he paid the Germans to uh, deport Jews. And she came on a transport of a thousand to Auschwitz, and out of the thousand, three survived. I met Bozhenka in Auschwitz in 1943. So, before I continue, about our first encounter, I'd like to give you a little bit of a background. As I mentioned to you, we came in 42, my sister and I came with also my two youngest sisters who upon arrival were sent to the gas chamber. A few months later, Mila, my sister, I would like to show you a picture of Mila. Okay, you put a little bit more, please. Okay. Uh, came down with typhus. How did she come about that long with typhus? It's probably an, you know, a, a question that's not really a question a million ways. But we lived in one garment, a tavern dress. We slept in that same dress for months. We didn't wash for months. If you drank the water in Auschwitz, you came down with dysentery. There was one, you know, it's latrine for 800 people. 
you could only go at specified times for a specified period. And if you had dysentery and you couldn't wait your turn, you, all of it went into that dress. We were covered by lice. We were scratching non-stop. Our bodies were one big scab. Lice breed disease. And Mila came down with typhus. And was my big dilemma. Should I go with Mila? We knew that going to the Revere, you did not come back. <coughs> Mila was my idol. I thought that Hashem created one creature in the world like no one else. She was the most beautiful, the most charming, the smartest. And she had to be a saint because she tolerated me. I was a thorn in her side. I, wherever she went, I'd follow her. At age eight, I was going on 16. I had to be Mila. So, Mila was into the latest fashions. Okay. This is really not so much about me, not so I will stop with that. So the dilemma, should I go with Mila to the Riviera? I knew I could not, not go. And of course I went. It was good for Mila that I was there to help. She had dysentery. We were sleeping in the three-tier cots. And we were placed on the top tier. There was no way she could have gone down to get the chamber pot. And I was able to help. We were sleeping naked on the Revere with a blanket that was full of blood and pus and feces. Nobody washed these blankets. Nobody took care of the sick. There was a constant din, people begging for the chamber pot. There was no one there to help. If you could still <coughs> eat, and you saw somebody was on the verge of dying, you waited for them to die so you could have that extra soup. People were dying left <coughs> and right. And I had this vision of one particular girl on the Riviera who was Greek. She looked as if she had just arrived. She was blooming with <coughs> color. She was gorgeous, even with her shaved head. She looked so beautiful and healthy. Why was she there? You know, we, there were certain patterns in Auschwitz. The Greeks and the Dutch had it especially hard. The Greeks, because they didn't understand the German, we Pol Polish people spoke Yiddish and understood directions. They didn't, and they were beaten to a pulp for the least infraction. And I'm just in retrospect wondering whether she was there by mistake. And this girl was singing. And she was singing, my Yiddish mama in Greek. So, I met Bozhenka 
and I was of the Revere. As I mentioned to you, she came on a transport of a thousand, and only three survived. And the ones that had survived, by the way, those first transports, they were the ones who were building Birkenau, the roads and the infrastructure. But the ones who survived were usually the couples were usually in charge. And Bozhenka was in charge of the ravine. I have no idea how long we were there. When one day, Bozhenka came to my bank and called me down. And I was sure that was the end for me. But what she had to tell me was a horror of horrors. She told me that all of the sick were going to be liquidated for the gas chamber. She singled me out to save me. She was going to transfer me to a Christian barrack. She was risking her life to save me. You never knew what the response of the Germans would be. She told them that I was her sister. She could easily have expected that they would say to her, go with your sister. And my lifetime dilemma How was I going to face Mila? Should I be going with Mila? How was I going to look Mila in the eye? What would I say to her? Would I say she's going to die and I am going to live? I had to leave immediately. I did not say goodbye to Mila. I did not know what to say to her, how to look her in the eye. What was Mila thinking when I did not return? The next morning, they emptied the bar. They took me up to the gas chamber. I felt myself turning into stone. I will tell you something more than that. I decided that I had abandoned Mila. I don't deserve to live. However, I am living and breathing, so I have to punish myself. I will not be really among the living. I will not allow myself to develop or grow beyond where I was at the moment. Megillah came to the Christian barrack to look for Jews. In an instant, I jumped between two women under the blanket. I was such a tiny skeleton. He didn't see me. Bozhenka brought me back to her barrack. 
and I stayed with Bozhenka. And I was amazed at Bozhenka. She had actually given jobs to others. She had a few helpers. She had one little 17-year-old Eva who had been a convert to Catholicism. Her father was an actor and she thought she was, she looked down at Jews and she spouted communism. And Bozhenka was eating it up. Bozhenka was preparing to change the world, to make the world a perfect place. One day, Bozhenka was able to get a piece of pork from a Christian lady who received packages from home. And that was like finding a diamond. And she didn't want to eat it. She made me eat it. And I refused. And she forced me. And she reminded me later that I went out and forced myself to vomit. But it didn't take very long till I came down with typhus. Dr. Miller <coughs> came around and he had my number written on the list for the gas chamber. And once your number was written down, it never in the history of Auschwitz did it ever come off. And Bozhenka pushed me to follow Mengele as he was going out to ask him for my life. I did not want to speak to that butcher. What reason did I have to believe that he would save me? He had more than a million to his credit of murder. Why would he save me? And Bozhenka pushed me out the door. And I approached Megan and asked him to return to remove my number. And Mengele replied very warmly, don't worry, little girl, you will be okay. And I argued with him. I told him, you know I won't be okay unless you return to remove my number. What happened that instant is nothing short of miraculous. The Allies refused to bomb Auschwitz, even though by then they had a successful escape from Auschwitz. Rudolf Verba, who was one of the escapees, who escaped to Hungary to warn the Hungarian Jews of what was awaiting them in Auschwitz. And Rudolf Ver Verba mapped out Auschwitz. The Allies knew exactly what was what. And ex-Governor McGovern said, who was an ace bomber, and bombed many facilities adjacent to Auschwitz that were producing raw material for the war effort. He said he could have bombed Auschwitz, but the Allies refused. Some claim that there was no option, I wonder. But the instant I spoke to Mengele, they were circling over Auschwitz in a re reconnaissance flight. And Dr. Mengele, the superhero, turned out to be a super 
power. When he heard the siren, he turned ashen and shook with fear. And because he felt so vulnerable that particular instant, he called to his assistant to remove my number from the list. Following that incident, Bozhenka knew she had to send me away. She said Mengele has an incredibly good memory. And when he returned and would see me, he would definitely dispatch me to the gas chamber. So I joined the ranks of the others. And since I am focusing on Bozhenka, I will not talk about that interval. I will just talk about the ne next episode with Bozhenka. I woke up one day in a strange place. I have no idea how I got to be there. It turned out that I had a second bout of either typhus or typhoid with very high fever, which put me in a coma. And it appears that I was in a coma for a month. And yes, this is one of the documents. And actually, I also have a second document. And the first document indicates it was dated December, 20, December 13, which I don't have on the screen. December 13, 44. Bozhenka, without my being aware of it, kept track all along of where I was and what was happening to me. And when she got word that I was sick, she arranged for me to be transferred to the Gypsy Revere, Gypsy Camp Revere. As you know, there was a gypsy camp. It was empty by then. They took all the gypsies to the gas chamber. And Bozhenka had me transferred to the gypsy camp Revere. So I mentioned that the first test was taken, uh, which I have a document for, December 13. The next test was taken January 10, 45. The death march took place January 18, 45. January 10, I was still in the coma. So it seems like I woke up about two or three days before January 18. And when I woke up, there was a lot of commotion in Auschwitz. The Russians were liberating Poland, and they were about to liberate Auschwitz. We knew they are not going to let us live. But by November, word came to Auschwitz from Berlin to destroy the gas chambers. <coughs> so how were they going to kill us all in such short notice? So the rumors were they would dynamite the entire camp and all the records. Nobody knew what was going to happen. In the end, The Germans never lacked for ideas of murder. 
so they instituted the death march. It was an incredibly cold winter. Some say 20 below zero, and the snow was knee high. We were in rags with no shoes, with wooden clogs and no socks. Wooden clogs don't bend when you walk, you shuffle. They figured if we march in this kind of weather, in our racks, without food, without water, and we march fast, that we will just drop dead. And if you slow down marching, you were shot. Bozhenka approached me. She told me, I have one of two options. I can decide to remain or go on the death march. Who in their wildest dreams could ever believe that you would be on the other side of the Auschwitz gates. <coughs> you knew the only way out of Auschwitz was through the chimneys and smoke. And here we were going to be marching out of Auschwitz. I told Bozhenka, wherever you go, I go. It may not have been a good decision. It probably wasn't. <coughs> Bozhenka found a wagon. And she pulled me on the wagon. I was still burning up with fever. The wagon broke. She found a chair, inverted me, and pulled me on the chair. And that broke. I ended up walking. <coughs> I tried with all my might to maintain the pace. I had survived five and a half years of the Holocaust. <coughs> I was beginning to see the war ending. I thought it was so unfair to die just before it ended. And I marshaled all my strength to maintain the walk, but I was slowing down. And Bozhenka started hitting me with all her might without saying a word. She told me later she wanted to make me walk, to motivate me to walk. And it did help at first. But it didn't take very long, and I slowed down again. And Bozhenka saw the gun being ready for me to be shot. And she quickly grabbed me and carried me. How in the world was it possible for her to carry another. <coughs> she was risking her own life to carry me. Eventually, I did walk intermittently. And when I walked, she was supporting people in front of her and in back of her. Obviously, I'm here to tell the story. We made it. We made it to Robinsburg, another infamous camp that was built for German women, political prisoners with their children. The camp was built for five 
thousand. They had a hundred and twenty thousand because these death march were arriving from all over. They had no room for us. We slept outdoors in the bitter cold and snow and I burning up with fever. Eventually, they were shipping us out of Robinsburg to other camps, but they refused to let me go. Bozhenka arranged a group of people who surrounded me. Again, I was such a tiny skeleton. The guards didn't see me, and I managed to get out to a camp called Neustadt Gleiber. <coughs> and after we left, we heard <coughs> that they found children in Ravensburg and gassed them. In Neustadt Gleiber, their theory was, if you did not work, you didn't need to be fed. Bozhenka was working in a plane factory. I was not. Bozhenka received her very meager rations in the factory. Starvation rations. She didn't eat it. She brought it back to camp to share with me. I am mentioning the different things Bozhenka did for me. But Bozhenka was a factory of saving people, each time at the risk to her own life. She was working, I'm sure many of you know the name, Tilla Orlan, who had a high position in Auschwitz, who was a Sarashinira teacher and very loyal to Sarah Shanira students and Chilla Orlan was involved in rescuing many people. But in each case she involved Bozhenka and Bozhenka's risk to her life. And Bozhenka was brazen when it came to saving. She would tell a German, that someone higher above him ordered certain things that would allow her to save people. That could have easily been verified. She was very brazen about it. She, it was, she, this was constant on her agenda. So by May 45, we were liberated. And what was Bozhenka's first attempt? She was the first one to open the gates, to go look for a cow, to bring me milk. And liberation. Liberation was the worst time of my life. For the first time, I was free to think and feel, not to worry, to live to the next hour. And I had to come to the realization and all my mother's 11 siblings. We were a family of six children. My aunts and uncles had larger families. I was sure that not one had survived. So at age 14, I found myself alone in the world. 
word came back from Poland that you could not return to Poland because the Poles were murdering Jews after the war. They were afraid they would claim their homes back. Where was I going to go? To whom? We were meandering with Bodenka all over Germany, trying to avoid the Russians, sleeping in forests sometimes. Once we met two men with a horse and wagon who ordered, offered us a ride, very nice. But when we arrived to the town, these men were arrested. They were high-ranking Nazis. There was still an issue of borders. You could not just cross any border. Bozhenka wanted to return home. She had no problem getting back to Czechoslovakia. She came from there, but I was not Czechoslovakian. Bozhenka invited me to go home with her. Bozhenka lived in a remote village. I forget how would I ever find anyone? Would I be destined to live there for life? Bozhenka came from a non family. She told me she did attend Hebrew school. When she was young, she had to travel out of town to attend, but they had no sense of Yiddishkeit. She came home, and much to her surprise, she found her parents. They owned a farm which was bequeathed to them, which what seemed to have been a major farm where they were hiding in that farm during the war. Now, I came there, and at that point, they owned an inn. It seems this is how they made a living. So they had a huge square courtyard with two-story homes around the courtyard, but there wasn't one customer there. Things were very tense because the Russians were agitating. They usurped that courtyard for rallies. Uh, I became part of the family and was enrolled in school. Now, what's interesting is parents were simple people. Even though they had higher aspirations. They sent their daughter to the big town to become a nurse. Uh, they spoke German. They were disdainful of uh, some areas that were adjoining, what do they call them? The, uh, I don't know, I'm surprised that I speak as well as I do till now. <laughs> The limit, how much I can remember, but it'll come. Okay. Uh, and uh, what was interesting, they were simple people. Bozhenka at home was a very ordinary daughter. There was nothing to distinguish her to to bring out to see what her potential was and who she was. So, Bozhenka eventually, you know, all of uh, whatever was happening to us, all of us had endless kind of miraculous stories. A cousin of mine met someone who knew me and knew where I went, and he came to claim me. And by that time, he knew that my brother survived. And I was able to join my brother. I did not hear from Bozhenka until 1970s. The Russian put a clamp on communication. 
they were not allowed to write to America. I did not know what was happening. So in the 1970s, Bozhenka arrived with her brother who married a non-Jew. Her, bro her brother had two daughters. Uh, Bozhenka never married. There were not enough Jews in Slovakia, Czechoslovakia, to marry. And by the time she came in the 70s, it was, she was too old. So they settled in Baltimore. She got a job as a scrub nurse. Her niece had one child, and her niece was working night shifts. Bozhenka raised that child as her own until high teens. You know, there are no words to describe Bozhenka. Never a word, word of complaint. She had physical issues. She tended her blood pressure tended to go as high as 220 and had to be hospitalized frequently. She also had a thyroid surgery and they damaged her vocal cords. So it was very hard to communicate. Her voice would trail off after a while. She took such pride in my family. So by when her brother retired, he moved to Florida, to Ocala, north of Florida, to a retirement village. Huge, it was like a maze. Bozhenka was very well settled in Baltimore. She had lived in a very poor neighborhood, but she was friends, the whole neighborhood loved her. Her home was beautifully, tastefully furnished. She read an awful lot. And she maintained <coughs> such dignity and integrity. She moved to Florida. That was a major catastrophic change because she lost her doctors who knew her. She lost her neighbors. The community in Florida was totally disinterested and uncommunicative. She drove until she was 95. She did her own shopping and cleaning, refused any help. From time to time, we would fly over the whole family to see her. When my son-in-law told her, so I wanted to praise her for what she had done. She says, what are you talking about? I didn't do anything. She had a different shilhu or arv. To her was, one eats, one drinks, one does what is human, what a human is supposed to be doing. And you don't get praised for eating or drinking. You it comes naturally and matter-of-factly, and there's... I, I didn't do anything. She was totally amazed that he would think in those terms. <coughs> By 95, she was hospitalized. She was a very serious disease, and we caught all <coughs> kinds of commitment communicable diseases, and we thought she wouldn't make it, but she did. She lived another year. She died in December of 16, at the age of 96. And she also told my daughter that if Mengele had not ordered my removal from the from the list going to the gas chamber, she planned to go to the gas chamber with me. She
she didn't want me to die alone. How do you explain a person like that? I'm the worst for her, that I'm the worst for the Holocaust, and the not, that I'm the worst for a person like Bozhenka. And Bozhenka up there, I hope you forgive me. And I think Bozhenka is a big maha up there. <laughs> and I think she's still taking care of me. And she would tell me, Moya Bronichka. Go home and take care of yourself. So on that, I'm a confident. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Bronya for really a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And, and it's hard to bring tears to my eyes here, but uh, after being here for 12 years, but uh, Bronya managed to do it today. Um, I, does anybody have any questions? I have a couple questions. If you don't. All right. Well, I. Yeah, okay. Yes. I just, have, I just have one one small question. At the beginning, you mentioned that the Greeks had a problem in the concentration camps, and that was obvious that they didn't, they couldn't manage the language. What was the problem with those who came from the Netherlands? Yeah, I think I didn't mention that. Oh, Brian. Brian. They had, the ones from Netherlands had too soft a life. And they just died so easily because they just could not sur survive this. We from Poland had a much harder life. And we were used to, uh, to hardship. And we already had, we had six years of it. So when I mentioned that Bozhenka was in charge, at the same time, all the Slovakians, and I may have mentioned it, who had survived, who had positions of leadership, they were the most brutal ones. And they had to be brutal because they were watched all the time. If they were not very brutal, they'd both lose their jobs. And who was able to survive if only three out of a thousand survived? So it was the most, the toughest and the cruelest ones. And in that milieu, there was Bajan. And just one, one question. Yeah. I may have missed it. How did Mezek find you? Mm -hmm. A cousin who happened to have looked for his relative in a town called Teshin. Teshin was a border town between Poland and Slovakia. Half of Teshin belonged to Poland and half. So he had, he could cross the border easier because he was there. And he came, we don't know who he met. He met someone who knew me and knew that uh, where I went, a cousin who settled in Israel, you wouldn't know him, and he came to fetch me.